Modern photo editing software allows us to make remarkable changes to photographs, both for artistic purposes and also to deceive people. As a result, people no longer trust the photos that they see. Of course, mistrust in photos is not new. For example, some people theorize that this photo from the moon landing is fake, but manipulated images have become ubiquitous. For example, they impact the media. This past fall, when Hurricane Sandy struck New York, the internet was flooded with fraudulent images of the damage, and many of those made their way into the press and created confusion about the events that had actually transpired. These photos also impact matters of national security. This past spring, the United States and South Korea performed joint military exercises, which prompted North Korea to release this photo, in which they duplicated a number of the ships to make it seem that their military was more impressive. So this proliferation of manipulated images has eroded the public's trust in photography, and also it undermines the value of a photo as forensic evidence. The field of photo forensics has emerged to address these issues. In a typical forensic setting, an analyst is asked to determine whether a single photo of unknown origin has been manipulated in some way. Such photos rarely contain a digital watermark which we could use to prove their authenticity. We can, however, detect manipulation by looking for inconsistencies and in properties of the photo. For example, we might wonder whether the shadows in this somewhat remarkable photograph are inconsistent in some subtle way. A growing body of forensic methods is being developed to detect inconsistencies in a variety of image properties, and today I'll describe how we can determine if the shadows are inconsistent when a scene contains a dominant point light source. To begin, let's consider a slightly simpler scene. Shown here is an image that's been rendered with a point light source, and I've marked that light source with a small white dot. Now, if the shadows in this photo are physically plausible, they must agree with the location of that light. So, just by looking at this photo, we might guess that the shadows are plausible because our light source is on the right, and the shadow from the cone is being cast off to the left. However, in more complicated scenes, this type of visual analysis is known to be both subjective and also error-prone. We can, however, objectively determine the consistency of shadows by thinking about their basic geometry. So imagine standing in this scene next to this point on the tip of the cast shadow, and imagine drawing a ray through the corresponding point on the tip of the cone, and then extending that ray off to infinity in the world. Somewhere along this ray in the world, you'll find that point light source which has cast our shadow, and furthermore, this ray in the world will project into the image to become a line, which is this line that I've drawn here, uh, which extends beyond the figure boundary. Now, note that this holds regardless of whether our light is close to the scene or infinitely far away, and it holds when the ground is not flat. For example, in this scene, our shadow is being cast onto another object, but our line construction still holds. So we can constrain the projected location of our point light source to lie along this line, and in this particular photo, since we can see where that light source is, we can verify that the shadow is plausible because that light does indeed lie along the line. Of course, in practice, we have a problem because shadows are rarely this well-defined. For example, in this scene, a rock is casting a fairly ambiguous shadow, and we can select a point that's in the shadow, but we can't determine the corresponding point in the rock, and so we can't construct our line constraint. This leaves us with two options. We can either give up, or we can ask, well, what information is provided by the shadow that's available? And in this case, we can make a conservative statement and say, whichever point has blocked the light, it must be some point on the rock. And so there's a set of plausible correspondences, which gives us a set of plausible line constraints. So let's just draw all of the plausible line constraints. These lines fill a wedge-shaped region in the image, which in this case I've drawn to encompass the entire rock, because we know that the true line constraint, that's this dotted line, must pass through some point on the rock. We can therefore constrain the projected location of our point light source to lie within this wedge-shaped region, which of course extends beyond the figure boundary. And this gives us a way to think about the constraint that these ambiguously shaped cast shadows provide on the location of our light. Now, note that thus far I've been selecting points that are along the boundary of the shadow, and that's because we typically find salient features there, but actually it's not necessary. For example, we could select this point on the interior of the shadow, and although it's not clear which point on the rock has blocked the light, we do know that it must be some point on that rock, and so again we have a set of plausible correspondences and line constraints, which gives us another wedge-shaped region in the image that encompasses the rock as well as the projected location of our point light source. Now, note that in practice these wedge-shaped constraints are going to be more useful than the line constraint, not only because shadows are typically ambiguous, but also because images have a finite resolution which will prevent us from unambiguously identifying perfect correspondences between points. Okay, 
So now we have a way to use the cast shadows in our photo to constrain the projected location of our light source. Another type of shadow appears on the surface of the rock, and this provides a constraint as well. These so-called attached shadows form where the surface of the object smoothly transitions into shadow. And in the case of an attached shadow, if we select a point that's in the shadow and along that boundary there, we know there must be some point that's on the object which has blocked the light. And we'd like to find that point because then we could construct our line constraint, much like we did for the cast shadows. But we can't determine that correspondence. For example, this point could be slightly above or below the one we've selected. We can, however, make a conservative statement and say whichever point has blocked the light, it must be on the illuminated side of this attached shadow boundary. And so again, we have a set of plausible correspondences and line constraints. And in this case, they fill a half-plane shaped region in the image, which I've shaded here in red. The true line constraint, this dotted line, must pass through this region, and so we can constrain the projected location of our point light source to lie within this half-plane. And this gives us a way to think about the constraint that these attached shadows provide as well. All right, so now let's back up and remember that our goal is to figure out if the shadows in a photo are physically plausible. And of course, that's only true if all of the available shadow constraints can be satisfied. For example, shown here are two constraints. So we can frame the physical plausibility of shadows as a constraint satisfaction problem. We can describe our attached shadow constraints in terms of a point P that lies along the boundary of the attached shadow and a direction vector N that is orthogonal to the boundary. This gives us a linear inequality constraint, which I've shown in the bottom. The projected location of our light source, let's call that X, it has to be on the side of the boundary identified by the vector N, and this boundary must pass through our point P in the shadow. Now what about those wedge-shaped constraints? Well, we can describe those with a pair of half-planes. These two half-planes intersect to describe our wedge-shaped region, as I've illustrated here. So the boundary of these two half-planes pass through our point P in the shadow, and their direction vectors N1 and N2 are oriented to face one another. This gives us a pair of linear inequalities, which I've written on the bottom of the slide here as a linear system. So on the left, we have a matrix in which each row contains those vectors, N1 and N2, those multiply our light position x. And note that on the right here, I'm using the curled inequality to denote the fact that we're making an element-wise comparison to the zero vector. OK, so now we have linear inequality constraints from both the cast and the attached shadows in our scene. And all we have left to do is to determine whether these constraints are satisfiable. So we'll combine them all together into a single linear system, which I'll call nx minus p. This matrix N contains in each row one of those vectors that are orthogonal to the various constraint boundaries. Now, given constraints from an authentic photo, there should exist some light position X that satisfies all of our inequalities. There is one exception, however. If the light is behind the camera rather than in front of it, it will actually project onto the opposite side of all of our constraints under linear perspective. Uh, this is a little counterintuitive, and we describe it in more detail in the paper, but in practice it doesn't create a particular problem. In practice, we solve a two constraint satisfaction problem. In the second one, which I've illustrated in the bottom, we simply reverse the direction of all of our constraint boundaries. And our shadows are physically plausible if either one of these two constraint satisfaction problems can be satisfied. Uh, for simplicity, in the remainder of my talk, though, I'm going to focus on the more intuitive situation in which the light source is in front of the camera because this special case doesn't create a particular problem for any of the methods that I'm going to be describing. Now, if our shadows are consistent, there must exist a light position that satisfies our system of inequalities. However, if some of our shadows are inconsistent, then some of our constraints may be violated. And we can account for this by adding a vector of slack variables, s, onto the right-hand side of our linear system. We have one slack variable for each of those constraints, and this allows us to assign some positive amount of slack to any constraint that would be violated by the light position. Of course, we'd like to find a light position x that minimizes the amount of slack that we need to assign to the various constraints. So this gives us a linear programming problem. We collect all of our inequalities into a single linear system. In the first row of the system, we have those shadow constraints. And in the second row, we constrain the slack variables to be positive. We'd like to find some light position x that minimizes the amount of slack that we need to assign to the various constraints. And so we'll minimize the L1 norm of our slack vector as which I've written here as an inner product. 
If the solution to our linear programming problem specifies that all of our slack variables are zero, then our constraints can be satisfied. On the other hand, if one or more of those slack variables are non-zero, then one or more constraints are violated and our shadows are not physically plausible under the assumption of linear perspective and a point light source. All right, so now we've got a way to check if our shadows are consistent, and in a typical scene, a multitude of shadows might be present, for example, in this synthetic scene. In a forensic setting, we assume that an analyst is available to specify these constraints, and we therefore developed a graphical interface which will guide that analyst to identify conflicting constraints when they're present in the photo, and I'd like to briefly demonstrate how this guidance works. So to begin, the analyst will specify, in this case, a first constraint that conservatively encompasses the corner of the cube. Once they've entered that first constraint, the interface will automatically render a yellow wedge which follows their cursor. The meaning of this wedge is more clear once they've entered their next constraint. This yellow wedge identifies for the analyst the directions from their cursor in which they should expect to find an object that's casting a shadow. More formally though, this yellow wedge is a constraint which exactly encompasses the feasible region of our linear program. So that's the region of the image where the light might be, given the constraints we've entered. So if the analyst enters a new constraint that is smaller than this yellow wedge, they will implicitly make the size of that feasible region for the light uh, become smaller. And so this yellow wedge will guide the analyst to find useful constraints. Their task is simply to make this yellow wedge as small as possible by entering new constraints into the system. When entering the attached shadows, the interface will automatically suggest an attached shadow boundary by computing the image gradient, and this greatly speeds up the entry of the attached shadow constraints. Also note that this video has been sped up slightly as well. This yellow region is particularly helpful because it can identify for the analyst when even highly ambiguous shadows would be useful in their analysis, for example the shadow that's being cast by the cylinder. If the analyst encounters a point in the shadow for which the yellow wedge misses the object, then they know that they've detected some kind of inconsistency which suggests that there's been a forgery. They enter one final constraint in order to prove that inconsistency. And the interface will then automatically reveal to the analyst a small set of conflicting constraints from among the constraints that they entered. For example, shown here are three conflicting constraints. The analyst can use these as evidence of the forgery, and more importantly, they can logically defend or debate the validity of each constraint in order to verify their analysis. In this way, we shift the debate away from whether the shadows look consistent, which is known to be highly subjective, to the more objective task of determining if a particular point in shadow was cast by a particular object. Okay, so now we've got a way to check if our shadows are consistent, and we have a graphical interface which will guide us to identify conflicting shadows when they're present in the photo. Before we start analyzing photographs, though, let's get some intuition for how useful these constraints might be in detecting forgery. To answer that question, we simulated the creation of forgeries by rendering pairs of photos in which the lighting differed, and then combining the constraints between them. For example, in this pair of photos, I've included constraints from the photo on the bottom, from the cube, and this small sphere. We detect forgery if the combined constraints are not satisfiable, and of course we repeat this for many pairs of photos in which we randomly vary the lighting. Shown on the right here is a plot of the probability that we can detect forgery. Along the y-axis is that probability of detection, and of course that depends upon how different the lighting is between our pair of photos. So this lighting difference is along the x-axis, and we're measuring that as an angle within the image plane. If we include 10 constraints from our pair of photos, that's this bottom line, then we can detect forgery 80% of the time, that's the dashed line, provided that the lighting difference is about 100 degrees within the image plane. With 20 constraints, we can detect lighting differences of about 35 degrees, and with 50 constraints, we can detect lighting differences as low as 10 degrees. Now, note though that in practice, the analyst will be using the graphical interface to analyze a single photo rather than a pair of photos, and so in practice, that interface is going to guide them to omit many redundant constraints that have been implicitly included in these 10, 20, or 50 that I've described here. Okay, so now let's try this method on some actual forgeries. Shown here is a falsified photo in which this yellow dinosaur and also its shadow were illuminated by a different light source in the rest of a scene. An observer was asked to analyze this photo without knowledge of that forgery. They specified 10 constraints and correctly determined that the shadows are not consistent. Shown here is a small set of conflicting constraints that the interface automatically identified from among those 10 that they entered. 
Now remember that these regions that are shaded in blue are identifying the projected location of light sources that are behind the camera, and the red regions are for the light sources that are in front of the camera. You can see that these constraints are not satisfiable because the blue regions do not mutually intersect, even if we extend them beyond the figure boundary, and neither do those red regions for the lights that are in front of the camera. We can also verify that this analysis was performed correctly. Shown on the bottom here are magnified views of each of those constraints. The analyst has identified the feature that's being cast by the nose of this dragon onto the backdrop behind them, the body of this green dinosaur, and also the nose of our yellow dinosaur. You can see that these constraints are entered correctly because each of them conservatively encompasses the corresponding feature or object. All right, so now let's try this on another forgery. In this forgery, this person on the left and also their shadow were inserted. An observer was asked to analyze this forgery without knowledge of that. They specified 25 constraints and correctly determined that the shadows are not physically plausible. Shown here is a small set of conflicting constraints that the interface automatically identified from among those 25. You can see that these are, constraints are in conflict because our red regions for those lights that are in front of the camera do not mutually intersect, and neither do our blue regions for the lights that are behind the camera, even if we extend them beyond the figure boundary. Shown along the bottom are magnified views of those constraints. The analyst has identified the shadow that this person's head is casting onto the wall behind them a shadow that their foot is casting onto the sidewalk, and also a shadow that's being cast by the body of this person on the right onto the sidewalk as well. Okay, so to conclude, let's return to our photo of the moon landing. This provides a nice example because some people theorize that the shadows look inconsistent, and now we've got a way to objectively check that. Shown here is a set of 11 constraints that I've included from among a multitude of other constraints that I intentionally excluded in order to reduce clutter on the slide. These 11 constraints mutually intersect in this region that I've outlined in white. So this is the feasible region of our linear program, and our plausible light sources project there. We therefore determine that the shadows are physically plausible, and this highlights the strength of our approach. Namely, it's well known that observers have difficulty judging the physical consistency of shadows. So we allow the observer to do what the computer finds challenging, which is to understand the scene content. And we let the computer do what the observer finds difficult, which is to assess the validity of many geometric constraints. Now, note in practice that it is possible for a well-informed forger to deceive our method by designing those shadows correctly. Uh, this is typical in forensics. But by building a body of forensic tools which leverage additional features, such as the shading on the objects, we make it increasingly difficult and time-consuming for a forger to craft a convincing forgery. Thanks.